And You're live. We are live. Calling Chris Anderson in London. Call, this is London. Calling Rick Byer in Chicago. Uh, Chicago reading you of loud and clear, Chris. And uh, welcome everybody to History Happy Hour. And we'll get started in a minute or two once we give people a chance to, to sign on. And we want to welcome our viewers who are here both on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, and Chris, I, I noted that today is uh, Queen Victoria Coronation Day. So I'm sure that the Anderson family has been celebrating all day. But of you course. Know, yes. Do, 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 you know, along those lines. That was God Save the Queen, by the way. Yeah, I, I noticed. Uh, we're, we're, actually, I was listening to Victoria by the Kings before that. Uh, <laughs> so that helps. It is 160, 182 years ago. I believe it is uh, today, but then you probably know that. So I was an important want. day for us all. Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, hello uh, to everybody joining us, Doreen and Kathy and Joe and uh, other folks. Please do uh, say hello or give us a comment. Let us know that you're here. And uh, as we go along in the show, um, and uh, please, any questions or comments, post them up. We are looking at that as we go along. So, uh, who else we have here, Chris? Susan. Uh, Susan, hello. For, hope things are well in Maryland. Jack, uh, Ross, Joe, Catherine, and Doreen, of course, but we knew Doreen would be here. Jim Latin, George Luz Jr. It's Luz of Arabia to you. Luz of Arabia from last week. And uh, Michelle and Deborah and David, uh, who is – one person here from Texas, because we have another one who's going to join us shortly. But I think we can get started now. To uh, Tim, is that your new name, Tim? Chris, I thought I'd call you Tim from now on. Tim, uh, we, call we, Tim. Yeah, yeah, why not? So we can get, we'll get started by playing the award eligible history happy hour open. <laughs> The bar is open. The bar is open. And Chris, let's get right into it today. Why don't you start by introducing our guest and our topic? Yes. Well, uh, our guest this week I'm, I'm really excited about uh, is a wonderful historian named Dan King. Uh, and Dan is uh, very unique uh, in that uh, he is a Westerner who speaks, uh, reads, and understands Japanese. Uh, he's written extensively on the topic. He's ha has three books written about um, uh, all, all war in Asia, not just the, the war in the Pacific, uh, that we'll be talking about. He's also consulted. There is, are three of his books. I should also add that he did a wonderful book on uh, Japanese uh, military sake cups. Uh, but he's also consulted on a number of uh, movies and series that you may have heard of. Um, uh, the Wind Talkers, The Last Samurai, The Pacific, just to name a few, as well as documentaries. Um, so what we're going to be talking about today, um, specifically, uh, are Japanese naval aviators and during the war in the Pacific, but more generally, uh, Japan and World War II. And this is a wonderful opportunity for those of us with an interest in the war in the Pacific to, to get a view from the other side of the hill, uh, which we here uh, in the West don't often get. So I really want to thank you, Dan, for joining us from Texas and for the work that you've done and, and uh, you know, for talking about something that's really fascinating that we all need to know a lot more about. So thank you um, very much. I appreciate and, and Dan, it. Dan is uh, here in the middle of a Texas thunderstorm. He tells us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we want to know what cocktail you've brought to history happy hour. Well, I have Yamazaki whiskey, ah. fantastic Japanese whiskey. If you've never had it, I encourage you to try it. All right. That's okay. really. I like that. And what, what have you got, Chris? Well, I have a new one this week. I have um, an old peculiar. Just found that. Uh, but I want to point out, I, I'm drinking it in a glass uh, from Smith's Union Bar, uh, which oh. if you have been to Pearl Harbor, you may know was the hangout for the crew of the Arizona before Pearl Harbor. Wow. And nice. you? Uh, I am drinking a glass of uh, sake today. Oh. Uh, which I've oh, heated nice, up. Nice I've heated up to a nice uh, temperature, and my little I uh, have a little extra there for uh, when I run out of the first one. And I so I recommend a, a, a glass for that. 
trying to be, I didn't have the Aaron Burr glass. So um, that's, this is the glass I have. But uh, Dan, thanks so much for joining us. And Chris, why don't you start us off with the questioning? Well, I mean, I think one of the things that people are just going to be curious is that how is it that a nice young man from Texas wound up uh, speaking Japanese and getting involved in the topic? It's not something that, you know. Well, you know, when, when I was 16, I got a scholarship for the summer to spend two months in Japan uh, through the bank my dad was working for. And so I spent two months with a Japanese family and they had a grandpa who had been in the Japanese army in World War II. And he had a photo album that was filled with pictures of soldiers in Manchuria riding horses. And it intrigued me because what I thought the Japanese were like was different than what I saw in this photo album. And at the time I, I wasn't able to speak Japanese. I was still learning. And so I decided that I was going to go home and get my degree in Japanese from college. I was 16 at the time, but I already decided I wanted to come <laughs> back, live in Japan, learn more about the country, which was fascinating to me. You know, they had temples that were older than our country. Right. And the customs and cultures and the food was just fascinating. So I decided to get my degree, which I did from Cal State L.A. Uh, my, my professor was Dr. Kato who he himself was a kamikaze trainee when the war ended. And so mm. there again, I'm exposed to the Japanese military. He was a one, he is still with us, but he's a wonderful teacher. And so it kind of got me interested and I've always loved history and right. I've always loved the aviation. Yeah. My, my dad flew in B 29s uh, in the Korean war. So I was always interested in aviation. Right. So and, go ahead. Go ahead. Chris. I know. So <laughs> after you, Alphonse. So uh, I, I want to know, um, uh, so you, you were interested in this and you kind of had some entree. You went to Japan. You worked in Japan, I think, for about 10 years. You became very fluent, not simply learning the language in a rudimentary way, but being certified uh, uh, kind of for your ability. Um, but how did you go about uh, finding um, people to interview uh, Japanese military people? And uh, kind of what was the reaction of people when you started making inquiries like this as an American in Japan saying, hey, I want to talk to you about World War II? Right, right. Well, my first wife was Japanese and her uncle and her dad and uh, her grandfather had all been involved in World War II. So I heard their stories. And of course, her girlfriends, you know, had dads who were and uncles who were in World War II. So I started hearing their stories and I started thinking to myself, I've got to document this because these are things that we as Americans never hear and we right. don't learn about. Even if you want to read these stories, you can't because they're not in English. And some of them have published their stories, you know, in newsletters and things in Japan, like their, like their veterans newsletter or something like that. But it never reaches, you know, the U.S. So uh, I started writing articles for a little newsletter called Banzai. It's basically a collection of collectors who collect rifles and swords and stuff in the U.S. Yeah. And there I met a guy named Henry Sakaida. Uh, and he's, you know, a very familiar name in Japanese aviation. Uh, so, and he gave me a letter of introduction to Suburo Sakai in Tokyo. Wow. So I wrote a letter to Mr. Sakai. I said, hey, I'd love to talk to you and hear about your stories. Surprisingly, he wrote me back right away. And said, these are the days this month that I can I can see you. So come on up. Here's my address. Here's how you get to my house. You're at the train stop and everything. So I went to uh, Saburo Sakai's house. I thought I'd be there for like an hour or so. And I was there almost eight full hours <laughs> in his den. And he's telling me story after story after story. And he has all these pictures in his den and like pieces of airplane wreckage that people gave him and photos and about 50 golf hats. He was an avid golfer. So we're having this conversation about, you know, Japanese aviation. And then he, he goes, oh, just a moment. I'll be right back. He comes back with his box, opens it up, and he pulls out his flight helmet, the famous flight helmet, where he's got the hole in the top where he was hit, you know. And he's got the goggles and the scarf that he was wearing that day that he was shot down over Guadalcanal. And you can see where the bullet just nicked the top of the goggles and went through the top of the flight helmet. And so he, I'm holding this piece of aviation history which is now on display down in Texas at the Fredericksburg the Nimitz Museum. And I'm holding this and he says, oh, go ahead and put it on. I said, no, no I'm not worthy, not worthy, you know? I don't know. 
So he, I'm holding it and I'm just like stunned. And I'm holding this blood stained scarf, flight scarf, silk flight scarf. And I'm holding this bullet damaged, you know, flight helmet. And he says, Oh, come here, come here. You want to feel the scar? Come here, give me your hand. I said, No, no, no. And he said, and he, said give me your hand. he grabs my hand and he's rubbing my hand on his skull. And I can feel the dent, the divot where the bullet oh, went through and dented his skull, right? So he's telling me the story about that day. And I've got goosebumps because I've read this story about Subaru Sakai's fateful shoot down over the water canal, right? Yeah. And here I am in his den and he's telling me the story firsthand of what it was like, what he did, what he felt, uh, what it was like when he landed. So I said, okay, okay, I've got to write this guy's story. Yeah. But that's going to be a different book all by itself. I haven't yeah. written his story yet. Yeah. So and how I, long I, 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 how I met him long and he this? The other guys. This Sorry, is 1994. Not... Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> so he introduced me to other people. And, you know, it's kind of like you meet this guy and then you meet this guy and you meet this guy. And so uh, at, at any point, basically, during the interviews, if you say something that's rude or offensive or, you know, you could upset someone. Right. And then this stops. You know, people right. say, oh, don't talk to that guy because he's, you know, rude or you know, offensive or, you know, right. dumb or whatever. So I, whenever I would uh, meet a veteran. Army or Navy, Air Force, you know, uh, infantry, submarine, whatever it was, I would first promise them that I will tell your story exactly as how you tell it to me. I will not edit out anything you say. I will not add anything. I will not make it politically correct. So if you tell me something, it's going to go in the story. Right. And so I, I think I've been true to that. I've kept my word. I tell their stories and I add a little bit of historical um, reference points. Yep. Or things that the American average American reader wouldn't understand or wouldn't have any connection to. Mm -hmm. So I'll add things to make it more interesting or under you know easy to understand, but I tell their stories. Well, were they ever, I mean, taken aback by having an American say, I, I, I want to talk yeah. to you about this? Yeah, you know what it is? Is that surprisingly they say, I love to talk to you. Because, you know, I got the impression that the Japanese pilots of World War II were treated similarly to a our Vietnam guys were treated after Vietnam. Right. Nobody wanted to hear their stories. Nobody cared about them. They were accused of being baby killers, uh, the, the losers. You lost the war. And so these Japanese pilots who trained for years to get their wings, right? And they were at the top of their class, very intelligent men, athletically very fit, healthy men. They fought for their country, you know, th what they thought was right in their own country. Right. And after the war, they're, you know, they're called baby killers because the Japanese army got the reputation of uh, doing really bad things in China. And so the whole Japanese military got painted with this brush of what happened in a few isolated places in the Philippines and China. Mm -hmm. So these naval aviators, they're saying, hey, we never committed any crimes. We flew honorably. We fought honorably against the Americans, mano y mano, right? Yeah. And then after the war, you know, people uh, harass us. And I've heard this so many times that right before the war ended, the Japanese, you know, populace would say, oh, Mr. Soldier or Mr. Airman, thank you so much for your service. And then right after the war ended, it was, you know, you know, go to hell and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. They're like yelling at these guys. Yeah. So they felt totally betrayed uh, because they had served honorably and yet they're treated terribly by the average person. And, you know, it was kind of this shock to these guys. Right. right. So I, I come along as American. I say, I want to hear your stories. I want to tell them, I want to share them with Americans uh, truthfully. And every person I approached w said yes. Wow. And so I, I was able to get over 103 interviews so far of Japanese uh, airmen, sailors, submariners, uh, the, the suicide boat guys, the Shinyo, the Kaiten submarine suicide guys, uh, kamikazes. Pretty, pretty much a pretty good gambit of everything from the lowest private who was drafted two weeks before the bomb drop wow. to Lieutenant General in China. So I've got a pretty good wide range of different right. you know, people. Yeah. I've been very, very lucky. I was in the right place at the right time. Well, and you, but you must be, I mean, as you said, you do the job well, or otherwise they wouldn't have you over. So, I mean, part of this is your work and- Yeah, I, I appreciate, work. yeah. I, I respect anybody who fights for their country honorably. I really do. You know, they, they were, they, you know, they didn't know that they were the bad guys at the time. Because there was only one media source in Japan, and that was the NHK.
and the Japanese government controlled all newspapers, all magazines, and the one radio station. So the Japanese people in general heard only what the military controlled government wanted them to hear. And that was not always the truth, mm -hmm. not always factual. So you really can't blame the average Japanese person for being, for thinking that things were, that were they not, you know, right. the Americans were not trying to take over all of Asia. We were not trying to take over Japan. We were not trying to enslave the people of China and the Philippines and Japan and Asia. We just weren't. Right. Uh, and, that, and that was evident when the war ended, we walked away from it all. You know yeah. that. Uh, so a lot of Japanese people, especially the people in the eighties and nineties, they would tell me that they felt they'd been betrayed mm -hmm. because the message they got before the war ended was we have to defend our country because the Americans are going to come in and they're going to bulldoze everything. And they're right. going to destroy our temples and shrines, or they're going to enslave us all, and our culture will disappear. But then, when the war ends, ends, American you know occupiers come in, they're chewing gum, handing out chocolate bars, you know, and they're all these friendly, nice young, you know, fresh dressed guys. Right. And a lot of the Japanese people said, "Wait a minute, this is not what we were told was going to happen. Yeah. And these guys are not trying to enslave us or kill us all." So they realized a lot of people felt they'd been betrayed, you know, right. by the government. Yeah. So uh, I want to just remind our, our audience that uh, we're talking to uh, Dan King uh, uh, about Japanese uh, veterans and specifically about Japanese naval aviators. And Dan is the author of several books, including uh, The Last Zero Fighter. And, you know, what I found um, uh, as I was going through the book, Dan, is that some of the, the individual stories are really interesting and the guys are really interesting. But I also just suddenly found myself, it, it, it was almost like, um, uh, I, I don't know, being a lifelong Red Sox fan and suddenly being plopped down in Yankee Stadium and being taken through what it was like to be a Yankees fan for the last 75 years. But I mean, it was kind of like, you know, I'm looking at what are familiar events to me as a historian but from a completely unfamiliar perspective and the context is all different. The place I'm looking at it from it is different. And so um, I thought it was just really, really eye opening. And I wondered, um, as I was reading, you have a couple of great accounts of, of Harbor there, uh, one from Haruo Yoshino. Um, and I know you talked to, uh, to Mr. Abe, who I had the pleasure to meet uh, some years ago, who was at Pearl Harbor. What 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 was the perspective of these pilots as they're approaching the war in the Pacific? What are, what is kind of in their heads? Well, you know, I mentioned Mr. Yoshino. I've got a picture of him right here. Here we go. He's the guy in the center. If you can see it, right yeah. here, Mr. Yoshino. Oh, this one. Yeah, uh, he was. He dropped the torpedo hit the USS Oklahoma at Pearl Harbor. And, you know, I was interviewing him and we were in his home. It's about 110 years old. His grandfather built it. Uh, his father was born in the home. He was born in the room that we were sitting in. And it's all tatami mat flooring and beautiful thick oak beams. It was like out of a uh, James Clavell novel. It was just beautiful. And so he's telling me the story of Pearl Harbor. And he said that they didn't know that they were attacking the Americans until I guess it was the day before is when they were told we're going to go bomb a place called Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> and so Mr. Yoshino was, was his first thought was why, what, what do they do? Why are we, what's going on? He had no idea. They kept it a secret, even from the pilots, because uh, the torpedo pilots, the dive bomber pilots and the fighter pilots all trained at different bases separate from each other. And so, and it wasn't really apparent to any one of them that the base they were training at was anything different, just a normal training mission. So to me, what's interesting is after the attack, when he returns to the Kaga, I asked him, I said, so was it, was it, was it like a celebration? Were you guys having a big party afterwards because you, you know, knocked all these battleships out? And he said, uh, no, we lost a lot of good crewmen. It lost a lot of my friends who I trained with for months and months. And it was really sad seeing all the empty bunks. And I had never thought about it that way you know, looking from the, the other viewpoint. And he said that it was just a very solemn journey uh, back from Pearl Harbor, missing 15 of his friends because they'd lost five uh, torpedo bombers. 
Did, um, yeah, I mean, I, I was did a couple of things about the Pearl Harbor thing that I was interested in. When you were speaking about him, he mentioned that um, that they were talking about doing a third wave, but they're, the, you know, the, the famous third wave attack at Pearl Harbor and that it should have been carried out, but it wasn't. What, do you, I mean, did you get a sense that at that time some of these pilots were like, why aren't we going back? Or is this kind of a myth that's grown up since the war? Or what, what did they think that they had they had achieved? Well, I, I asked uh, Mr. Maeda, who was also a torpedo bomber pilot, uh, I'm sorry, a, a, a gunner. I asked him, and he'd never heard of this third wave myth. Mr. Yoshino had never heard of the third wave myth. And Mr. Harada had never heard of a third wave myth. Uh, myth. So I don't know if it was other pilots on another uh, carrier who started talking about going in for a third wave. Right. But the three men that I talked to had said, yeah, there's Mr. Harada. As he said, there was only two waves planned. Okay. And there was radio silence. So he says if the, if they had wanted to do a third wave, they would have had to communicate that information to all the, the ships uh, right. with, you know, signal lights and flags. And it would be too confusing and too much information to relay back and forth. And he says that to his knowledge, there was never a, a third wave ever planned. But all three of the guys said it was a huge mistake not to hit uh, the, the fuel storage Right. And the dry docks. All, all of them said it was a huge mistake. Right. Yeah. Well, I, one of the things I thought was really interesting that you mentioned um, was that none of the none of the guys that flew at Pearl Harbor right, were got any medals or any awards. It was just no. That was it. That was it. There was uh, no special awards for them. No special recognition. You know, after Pearl Harbor, they went on to uh, you know, Wake Island. Right on the Philippines and a lot of other battles and, and nearly all of them were wiped out over the next few years. So there's only a very few. In fact, Mr. Harada was the very last surviving man uh, who'd been an, in a fighter pilot, uh, fighter pilot in Pearl Harbor. And he was also the last surviving pilot who participated in the USS Panay attack in 1937 uh, outside Nanking. Uh, that photo you just showed, that was uh, Mrs. Abe. She was... Um, uh, a widow of an Iwo Jima a guy who died at Iwo Jima. It's it's in my she's in my second book. Ah. She's the one that makes those wonderful little. Um, yeah, Here, yeah. Here's the bells. Yeah, the bells. I'll show you. Um, she makes these little handmade uh, little envelopes out of uh, scrap, you know, paper, you know, mailers and things, and then she makes these little peace bells. She takes the clam shells when she makes soup. It's called asadi, so asadi clam. And so she takes donated uh, kimono material. She wraps it around the clam and she attaches a little bell on a string. And she made these for our Iwo Jima veterans that would visit Iwo Jima each March. Yeah. And in the beginning, she made just a couple that she gave me. And then I handed them out to the veterans and she got a couple of thank you letters. And yeah. the next year she made 20 and then 30 and then 100. And... Uh, so in her mind, you know, she lost her husband in the war. She lost her brother in the war. She lost her father in the war. But she holds no animosity or hatred towards Americans because she knows that we didn't want to fight either. You know, right. they attacked us. So she makes these little good luck charms. And she says a prayer as she makes each one. And she says, may the wearer be, you know, free from harm, injury, and have good health. And so uh, she's given these to at least 500 people who visited Iwo Jima over the last 14 years. Well, you, you know, if you are a family, let her know. I have one of them. That's and, right. Uh, I've taken it all over. Yeah, you're, and you're safe. Right? Yeah. Yeah, she's a very, you know, for me to meet her and to know how much she suffered, and she raised two daughters by herself, no husband, no brother, no dad, and she was kicked out of her, her husband's house because they had too many people after the war, refugees. Right. So she right. raised her two daughters in, a, in like a, a widow's home, uh, running a sewing machine to earn money. Yeah, she has no animosity, no hatred towards her former enemies. So that was a really good lesson to me in the power of forgiveness, yeah. and letting yeah. go, you know, the hate. Yeah. Yeah. So that was she's an amazing person. Dan, you sent us some photos, and I, I'm hearing a little echo. So let's all make okay. sure our speakers are turned down a little bit all and right. not too loud. Um, 
you sent us some other photos that I didn't have a, a, a moment to, to ask you who they were. So I'll just pop them a couple on the screen and you can tell us because I'm All sure right. there's a, some interest. I'm sure you sent these ones to us for a reason and there are interesting stories. Sure. So well, how about this one? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Okay. So the photo I'm holding, uh, you know, that's the Medal of Honor recipient from Iwo Jima, Woody Williams. And we went to Iwo. Uh, he was given a flag by a fellow Marine who said, Woody, if you're going back to Iwo, I want you to return this flag. So uh, Woody gave the flag to the man in the center, Mr. Akikusa. Uh, he's on the cover of my book, A Tomb Called Iwo Jima, if you, if you, if you can see it. Uh, that's Mr. Akikusa when he was 17 on Iwo Jima. So uh, Woody gave the flag to Mr. Akikusa. And in the photo I'm holding, that's Woody and Akikusa on top of Mount Suribachi. So uh, Akikusa and I worked hard, mostly him, trying to find the family, which we found. And that's the son of the dead Japanese soldier. Oh, well. So we gave it back to him. And that was really neat closure. And Woody couldn't, you know, fly to Japan for the turn ceremony. So I went in, in his place. Amazing, amazing. I, you know, I, I've been asked to return uh, things to Japanese families, and I've returned maybe 23 or 24 things, everything from like the steel helmet, a pith helmet, flags, letters, postcards, you name it. And when, you know, if someone, usually the children of veterans will come to me and say, hey, my dad brought this back from Iwo. Could you help me find the family? I say, of course. And universally, the Japanese family are stunned that someone went to the trouble to return something. And, you know, in the, in the Japanese mindset, you know, when the bodies didn't come back, right? So the bodies were buried on Iwo or Saipan or Guadalcanal or lost at sea. And they have nobody to conduct, you know, a funeral with. And the Buddhist funeral rites, you know, require that ashes be burned or that the remains be burned and prayed over to release their spirits. So now they have nothing to pray over. So, you know, 50, 60, 70 years later, a flag comes back and that becomes their father or their grandfather or their uncle. So they can pray over that and release their loved one's spirits uh, from this earthly realm. And so it's, it's pretty important for the family members to get these items back. And they really appreciate it when it happens. But that was, uh, that was Woody Williams and he gave the flag back to Mr. Aki Kusa. Wonderful guy. Whoa. Yeah. So um, we have a, a question from a Rich, Rich Randall. Um, okay. And Rich would like to know, uh, were some of your interviewees at Midway? Uh, and what was their perspective on that battle? Because it's kind of a big one. Mm -hmm. in the war. Yeah, I was lucky enough to go to Midway with Mr. Harada. Uh, Mr. Harada was one of the, uh, uh, I guess he was like a defender of the carriers. And his job was to protect the carriers in case the Americans showed up. And this is what he had done as well at Pearl Harbor. And so at Pearl Harbor, he was very upset that he didn't get to go in with the attack because he'd been training and he was highly qualified and he was assigned the combat air patrol that morning. He was very bitter, very angry and not being able to go along, you know, with his fellow fighter pilots. Yeah. So the battle of Midway comes along. He's given the same job, babysit the fleet. And he begged, please let me go, you know, in with, with the, the attack group. He said, no, no, we need our best guys, come, you know, uh, babysit in the fleet. So he was pretty upset about that until the torpedo bombers show up. Uh, and he and his, they, they'd fly in teams of three, and they call it a show tie. So he and his show tie, uh, they knocked down five torpedo bombers. And, and we believe they're torpedo squadron eight. And we believe he may have even knocked down George Gay's plane. And his, you know, his stories are, are in the book, The Last Zero Fighter. Yeah. But all three guys that I talked to who were at uh, Midway were very angry and very frustrated. They thought that the, their leadership had made some very big mistakes. And of course, the Japanese Navy was not, was pretty inflexible compared to the U.S. Navy at the time. Um, and after, you know, they were fished from the water, uh, you know, Yoshino was in the water, Harada was in the water for hours. I think until midnight with uh, Harada. Uh, and they got taken back to Japan and they were quarantined because they didn't want the word to spread about what had happened at Midway because it was a huge disaster. And then they didn't know what to do with all these mixed bag of, you know, you had uh, 
pilots, you had uh, navigators, you had you know tail gunners, yeah, all these different guys together, but they were all from different air groups. They didn't know each other, so they had to kind of like aggregate these guys back onto another air group, and it took some time. So they kind of kept them secluded for a while. And I asked Harada san well, what if you had not been quarantined? Would you have leaked the story about Midway? And he said, no, why would we? We are patriotic airmen. I would never say anything detrimental to my country. And I thought, that's what any American pilot would say. Mm -hmm. And the things that these Japanese guys told me were things that American aviators have told me. And their stories sound just like the American stories. And the more, the more Japanese I met, the more I realized they're just like us. You know, they love their country. They love their families. They love their girlfriends and their wives. They love their parents. And they were fighting for what they thought was right from what they learned, you know, from their own uh, country and education system. Mm-hmm. And as far as the, the naval pilots, uh, the ones that I met have just been, you know, really interesting, uh, great guys with stories that were just like the American pilots. Right, right. If you met them, you would like them. Yeah. Well, we, well we, we have a we couple have of questions, questions, boom, boom, boom from uh, our, our audience. audience. And uh, one of them I want to go to first, a little out of order, uh, from David here is about how much flight training uh, the uh, average uh, kamikaze pilot had. And I want to I want to add to this question um, because this is sort of introducing this topic mm-hmm. that um, you know in the book you have a, a, a number of mentions of of the kamikaze effort. Uh, and and different people that you talked to were involved on the edges of it in different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, so perhaps you can uh, speak to it a little more broadly and also answering David's question, also telling us about that and 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 anything that that you learned talking to people that that we don't know and we should know. Sure. Excellent question, David. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. I'm going to show you a picture of the biplane that every Japanese pilot learned to fly in. And I'll try to get it close to the camera. But this is called the Akatombo, a Type 93 or Type 95 intermediate trainer. And it's painted orange because that's the color of stay away from me. I'm a novice. I'm dangerous. I'm not a good pilot yet. So the sign, the color of y- y- orange, universal in Japan, is stay away. I'm going to crash into you. So every Japanese naval pilot learned to fly on this, and they loved this plane. They nicknamed it the dragonfly because it was so forgiving it could just almost float like a dragonfly and not uh, stall and crash. And when I heard a lot of great stories is that the instructor would sit in the back seat, and they have like a little speaking tube that's hooked to it like a hose that goes to the guy in the front. They didn't talk through radios. They talked through this like a sound phone that went through a hose. And so the, the instructor would sit in the back and he would have a long stick. And instead of wasting time saying more rudder or whatever, he would just bash the pilot on the top of the head with his stick to get his attention. And then he would say, you know, more rudder or whatever it was. And so one pilot, he would put uh, folded cloth towels up under his flight helmet. So that when he got hit from behind with the instructor's stick, it wouldn't hurt as much. But the instructors were on to that and they're like, hey, wait a minute. It's not, it doesn't have the same little conk it should have. So he, he got punished for that. But every kamikaze pilot had training in these, every single one. Saburo Sakai learned to fly in these, every pilot. Now, the pilots would then go on to the zero, which we have here. Uh, this one happened to be signed by uh, two kamikaze escort pilots. Mr. Iwakura, Mr. Toshimizu, and there's Mr. Yoshino. So they would learn to fly on the Zero, right? Uh, the Type 21, the older Zero. Now, the, kamik- the early kamikazes, they were highly qualified, really good pilots who had combat training and were very highly skilled pilots. And as the war went on, you know, it, you're not going to have these guys uh, that have gone through three, four years training. And so they start dipping deeper and deeper into the barrel and getting these guys that had just barely finished, you know, this training, which is roughly 50 hours in this. Hmm. And they were sent out. Uh, you know, Mr. Kasai, he was sent out uh, and they're heading towards Iwo Jima and a couple of the guys fell asleep on the way to Iwo because they were so tired from the training and the monotonous droning sound of the engine and the sun coming through that canopy and it's hot in there. 
And he said he, and they were not allowed to break radio silence. And he talked about seeing one of the, uh, his junior fellow trainees just slowly drift off and crash into the water. So these guys, um, by the end of the war, the kamikazes had not received any dogfight training, any navigation over water training, and they could barely, barely fly formation, you know, with, with their, their show tie, their squadron leader. Mm -hmm. So these guys were usually led out to the combat zone by a Betty Bomber or a Ginga Francis or a more a highly advanced fighter pilot. And he would lead them out into the combat zone and just, they'd go off on their own. So as the war went on, these guys had, you know, almost, almost no training. So Dan, one of the things I, I would really like to get your perspective on um, that I talk a lot about on the trips is the, the tension between the army and the Navy. Um, and in your book, you tell this wonderful story or Yoshino tells a wonderful story about he, he has to emergency land or he, one of his buddies emergency lands on an army airfield. The army doesn't even tell yeah. This Navy pilot's commander that, oh, yeah, your guy is here. Your yeah. she and your friend is, is listed as killed in action. Um, they go to fix this poor guy's plane, and the Army and the Navy have separate cranks to start the engine on the plane. It just seems insane. It does. It does. It's, it explains, you know, one of the reasons why we won is because the Japanese Army and Navy, they almost fought against each other. Yeah. Said the, the engine crank, you know, if you're a, if you're a pilot, a zero pilot and you land somewhere and you're all by your lonesome, you're not taking off again because you need someone to crank the engine so right. you can get the contact and go. So, you know, this guy landed at an army base and they didn't have the crank wouldn't fit because their cranks were designed for the army planes. And you'd think that they would design that the starter cranks to match any kind of Japanese plane, but they didn't because right. the, the, the companies that manufacturers were different. They were competitors. And it's like you have a, you know, today we have a Toyota and a GM and the same parts won't fit on both vehicle because uh, they're competitors. Um, and we were lucky we didn't have that same mindset. Are you, I mean, you, you're going to commit to a real war. You're going to take, take somebody, somebody with you. By the way. <laughs> by the way, yeah. You know, I, I, got the, I got the general idea that the Japanese Army and Navy had been at each other's throats for a long, long time. And it doesn't just start in World War II. They had gone back to the samurai days with the two warring clans. So, but you know, the Navy guys and the Army guys generally did not like each other. Generally, uh, yeah. So, so Dan, I want to go back to. We have a, a couple of more questions coming okay. from people in the audience, uh, and uh, Jim Latin wanted to know about the. Uh, relative capabilities of the Japanese fighter planes uh, compared to the U.S. planes. And I know this is something that uh, that you talked at length to some of your, your interview subjects about, or, or if, let's say they talked to you about, uh, uh, for sure. So to give us a, a sense of that, and I guess we'd be talking about the Zero primarily against some of the, the planes that the uh, Navy and the Marines brought against them. Well, one of the pilots um, told me that they were on one mission and they saw four Hellcats flying about a thousand feet beneath them going a different direction. And he looked down and he told me, Oh, look at those beautiful shiny blue aircraft. Oh, I would love to be able to fly one of those brand new. It's not falling apart. It's engines are not coughing and wheezing. The landing gear will always work. And he felt jealous because by this point in the war, a lot of the Japanese aircraft had been, they've been through a lot and they were tired. And, and good parts were getting harder and harder to find. And good pilots were harder to find. Now, as far as comparing, you know, this aircraft against that aircraft, you know, that's kind of like a never ending, you know, discussion. But if you had uh, pilots of equal ability, it would depend on what altitude you were at. Like there were some Japanese pilots who said, I could handle P-38 no problem at a certain altitude because we could climb much quicker than they could. And if you get him in a spiraling climbing duel, they could almost always take out a P-38. While this was said, a wildcat, they called it, it was prey. Wildcats were prey to the zero. And uh, one pilot even made a gesture of like, you know, rubbing his hands if they ever caught wildcats. But hellcats were a different story. And the pilots would say, you see hellcats, you want to go the other direction because they have self sealing tanks, they have armor everywhere, and they have 650 calibers. They're nasty customers. 
and you know the zero to bring it back into play here uh, you have basically uh, no armor, no self-sealing tanks. At the time, you had these little, little tiny little seven, you know, 0.7 millimeter guns, which is what the the rifles shot, you know. And those little seven sevens are not going to penetrate the Hellcat's armor. So, the the Japanese had to get right up against the Hellcat to cause any damage. And many of them said, "You could shoot at a Hellcat all day, and it's never going to catch fire. It might smoke." And you might kill the pilot, but it's never going to catch fire. So from the ground, they'd be watching the dogfights, and they could see, okay, there's smoke. Ah, it's one of our guys. And they could tell the Japanese would flame out or smoke. And uh, the Hellcats were just really well-built planes. Now, if you go on to the Shidenkai, the George, the George could hold its own with, with any other American plane. If you had pilots of equal ability, uh, you know, the 343, the 343, the naval squadron, uh, they could hold their own against uh, Corsairs or Hellcats. Those but are strong planes. What you know, given the aircraft they had, and as the war goes on, our planes get better and better. Uh, yeah. One of the things that struck me um, that I want, I'd like to get your thoughts on are, are just how these guys were able to sustain the fight. I mean, some of the some of the guys in your um, in the book that you talk about, you know, they're talking about. Um, graduating classes of aviators that suffer 85, 90% casualties. Now, you know, in any other military situation, that's going to, that's just going to be a combat ineffective as a unit. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you think, or what they, what did they tell you, that they're able to sustain that fight for as long as they did? Yeah, you know, I think in, in like an American case, if you had 50 or 60% casualties, the guys would be pulled out and replaced with somebody else. Right. And these guys, you got a chance to rest and refit. But in the case with the Japanese, they didn't have those guys behind them ready to come up and fill the ranks. They just didn't. So yeah. it was just keep on fighting until you can't fight anymore. And it was, it was tough for those really good pilots in the beginning of the war. The ones that survived, like Mr. Harada, he was shot down at Guadalcanal. That's why he survived the war, he right. says. And Subro Sakai was shot down over Guadalcanal. So he had a nice rest period of recuperation. But the guys who kept on fighting were, were burnt out, used up at, at uh, Robal and a lot of other places in the Philippines, Saipan, and Iwo as well. And we had a lot of Japanese pilots who had 50, 60, 70, 80 kills. They were just basically, you know, they rolled the dice one too many times and they were shot down. Yeah. You know, the, the average in the beginning of the war, the average Japanese pilot had way more flight time than the American pilots because the majority of the Japanese pilots did not graduate from high school. Now, American pilots, uh, they were college graduates, almost always, whether they're Marines or uh, in the Navy, they were generally either in college or graduated from college. Well, nearly all of the Japanese pilots had joined the Navy when they were 15 or 16 and didn't even go to high school. And the Japanese mindset, that's the guy they want. They want the guy who's really young and who can adapt really quickly and physically really fit, you know, 15, 16, you know, you're, you're pretty strong and healthy. You can take, you can absorb a lot. So they would take these guys and they would put them through this thing called a Yoko Ren. A Yoko Ren is a two and a half year program where these guys would get a high school degree, learn math, science, uh, calculus, they'd learn English, they learn world history while learning how to fly. And once they graduated from this two and a half year program, they would go on to their, their flight assignments, their combat assignments. So these guys were really well trained in navigation over water, night navigation. And so they're like 18, maybe 19. And they've gone through way more training than the average you know, American guy has. And yeah. so in the beginning, their pilots were really skilled, really high quality guys. But those, but they didn't have very many. And so when they got wiped out, then it came down to the guys who had only six months, eight months, a year training. Uh, then, you know, it, it's tough to maintain those losses when you don't have people you know, to fill in the ranks. Uh, we have another question uh, I want to bring on here from uh, Michael Caldwell. It's a long question. Mm -hmm. He says, do you think that over 70 years uh, has passed, since over 70 years has passed, Westerners are more open to the Japanese viewpoint? As the impression is that there was quite an amount of hatred in the past concerning the Japanese, even more so than the Germans. I'm, Michael, I'm paraphrasing your question a little bit. But uh, what is your impression of that? Because obviously you're, you've interviewed a great many 
uh, Japanese uh, airmen and soldiers, uh, but you're presenting to an American audience. And I'm sure you've heard, gotten quite a bit of feedback from your American audience as well. So what is your what are your thoughts there? Well, can I, I just want to add on, tack on to that question. Um, Please. Have, I'd like to know how Japan's perception of the war has changed over those 70 years, too. Is one of the things we always get is the well, journal. That was my next question. Thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> okay. Well, I want to know. Okay. Well, right. the, okay. The first part. The first part. Okay. I'll say that, you know, I've been on uh, a lot of trips to Guam and Iwo Jima and Saipan and Petaluk uh, and other places with American veterans. And when the American veterans meet their Japanese counterparts, from my personal experience, I have seen no hatred or animosity between the two. And from what I've experienced is the American veteran says to the Japanese guy, you know, through me usually as a translator, oh, you were here on that day? Oh, well, so was I. Well, you survived. I did too. And it's more like two guys who survived a plane crash and they meet after 20 years and they're both surprised they both survived. And they'll ask questions about this or that. But generally, I don't see a lot of hatred between the actual people who were really there and fought against each other. <laughs> what I have seen is it's kind of like a um, uh, it's a strange kind of resentment or hatred coming from people who weren't even born at the time. Usually the veterans' sons or grandsons. Mm -hmm. And I'll get questions from people who are like my age or younger. And they'll say, you know, blah, blah, ding, blah, blah, you know. And I'll say, wait a minute, you weren't even born in 1945. How can you hate the Japanese people? And so they're hating the Japanese on behalf of their grandfather who was wounded on Saipan or killed somewhere else. And I'm like, you don't, you don't get that. You don't get to hate someone you'd never met on behalf of someone who's been dead for 30, 40 years. And so I don't, I don't buy into that. And especially because I've met so many Japanese and so many Americans who don't hate their former enemies. They've forgiven the past, they've moved on, and they look at their former enemies as you survived Saipan too. Wow, you know, good job. I'm, I'm so happy to meet you. And that's happened on Petaloo as well. And I'm going to write a Petaloo book, a couple of books down the road with Mr. Tsuchida. But anyways, that, that's the point I'm trying to say is that people who are actually there, from my experience, I don't know about other people, but from my personal experience, they don't hate each other when they actually shake hands and they meet. Just like the picture of Woody Williams on top of Mount Suribachi with Akikusa. Uh, Akikusa spent uh, quite a long, almost two years hiding out. Yeah, um, so it should be resentment. There should be hatred. But I don't see it when these guys meet. And what was the second question? Really? Uh, so, <laughs> well, it's the idea of how um, attitudes in Japan may have changed. You said that when the guys came back from the war... Yeah. It's almost like Vietnam veterans coming back here. But I, 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 one suspects and, and I guess the impression that that may have changed as the decades have gone by. I think so. I think so. I think a lot of the Japanese veterans now are respected for what they went through. And I, I think there's like little different factions. You know, no matter where you go, you have different you know, ideas about things. But in Japan, there are definitely people who appreciate and respect uh, the efforts of their Japanese veterans. Then you have other people who don't care at all. It's really not taught in the school system, unfortunately. Uh, one example, you know, my, my first wife was Japanese and she had a nephew and I, we were going to visit them sometimes. And he, I think he was in eighth grade. And I went over and I said, hey, what are you studying? What are you doing? He said, oh, we're studying uh, World War II history. And I was like, yes, let me see. I grabbed his textbook and I flip it open. I'm like, wait, where is it? And oh, he, here it is, it's just two pages. And on the left side, there's a picture of the atomic bomb going off. And on the right side, there's a picture of the surrender ceremony on September 2nd. And I go, hey, where, where, where's the rest of the story? Where's, where's the, uh, and I can read Japanese. So I'm reading. I'm like, hey, where's the Pearl Harbor part? And he says, what's Pearl Harbor? I said, you know, when you guys attacked Hawaii, you dropped bombs at Pearl Harbor and sunk our shit. And he says, oh, Uncle Dan, always making jokes. Oh, you're so funny. Uncle. I said, well, wait, no, I'm, I'm serious. Japanese bombed and killed almost 3,000 Americans. He's like, that's not funny, Uncle Dan. That's not nice. I go, okay. So, hey, Grandma, Grandma, I, you know, calls Grandma over. And I go, tell him about Pearl Harbor. And she goes, yeah, yeah, Pearl Harbor. And that's why my brother died at Guadalcanal. And she points over to the small black and white photo of a Japanese soldier in uniform next to the TV. 
And this little kid had been looking at that since he was born. And he'd never asked about it. They'd never talked about it. It was just this mysterious black and white photo of a man in a uniform. And so she told him and me at the same time for the first time about this uncle who died honorably fighting for his country in a faraway place called Guadalcanal. And this kid's eyes, you know, opened up and he was like, wait, I'm not getting the whole story here. And it feels like the Japanese government, in my opinion, is still trying to figure out how to deal with this whole thing and how to, to teach the students what happened from a neutral you know, standpoint as a historical thing without a lot of you know, emotions coming in and negative things. So I think they're just not really dealing with it very well and like the junior high and high school level. Yeah, I mean, that was my question because I, I you know, I, again, I, I spent a lot of, most of my time in Europe and, you know, the Ger every German knows at least vaguely something happened. You know, the, the, their degree of acceptance or denial, that's not a separate discussion, but they know what happened. Mm -hmm. And my impression is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the Japanese really haven't gotten dealt with that. And, and right. why do you think that is? Right. You know, when, when Clint Eastwood did the movie Flags of Our Fathers, and then he did the second follow-up movie, Letters from Iwo Jima, it was a smash hit in Japan. I think it was more popular in Japan than it was here in the U.S. Because the Japanese had almost forgotten about Iwo Jima. And as a result, the Japanese government gave Clint Eastwood the Rising Sun third class neck medal to say thank you for telling the war story from our viewpoint, for sharing the Japanese side of the war. And a lot of Japanese who, who hadn't heard about Iwo Jima or it was some kind of like, you know, misty, foggy name island somewhere saw what had happened and it kind of uh it, it peaked a revival in the japanese wanting to learn more about world war ii and uh, you know about history in general i think it was a great thing yeah, yeah do you think that it's evolving or do you think do you think they're ever going to kind of I come think, to terms with it or is it just too i think i th you know i think I'll, it's sad but almost all the japanese combat vets are gone yeah they're just gone especially the, the naval aviators uh and a lot of the soldiers who are still around were in boot camp at the time, or they just graduated and they never had any combat experience. And so there's fewer and fewer people to, to pass on the stories. And I think that's a shame because, you know, it is our world history. It's our joint U S Japan history. And without, you know, one thing I, I told myself I will never do when I meet a veteran, a Japanese veteran is judge that man because I wasn't in his shoes. I wasn't educated in his time. I wasn't raised in Japan. There was no internet. There was no overseas news source. There was no newspapers coming from overseas. No information at all. It was all what the government wanted you to believe. And I've met them, and I've I've met these Japanese, you know, pilots. Wonderful, outstanding dads, uh, hardworking people, very intelligent, uh, you know, uh, competent people. And I think, boy, this this guy would be successful in any country he was born and raised in. This that quality of people. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, these, a lot of people in Japan are never going to meet those guys. So all they hear is uh, what the government might tell them or what they might read on kind of like, a, you know, the, there's always right wing and left wing in any country you go to. And a lot of the more of the left leaning uh, schools and organizations want to portray all the Japanese veterans as evil, bad people. And mm -hmm. that the government you know, blah, 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 is bad. So. It's kind of a challenge to to study and learn history and pass it on without adding your own, you know, your own uh, feedback or your own comments. Yeah, and yeah. I, I try very hard not to do that. But but even here, you know, I would say both Chris and Dan, wouldn't you say that uh, there's there's also a lot of uh, people who don't know much about World War II? That that is that's not simply. I mean, the Japan thing is unique to Japan mm -hmm. and. But some of that is also true here as well. Maybe not in in England and Germany so much, since you know World War II happened there, as as you may know, Chris. Um, but um, you know, I, I do feel that while there are there's there are some people who know a lot, and even some young people who know a lot. There's a lot of young people who know little. Right. Well, you, well go ahead. Dude. Oh, I was going to say some some of the people who've helped me the most have been uh, young Japanese men in their 50s and 60s whose dads and uncles were in World War II, and they've wanted to learn more. And then they've helped me because in their viewpoint, oh, we've got an American who wants to 
learn the truth straight from the veterans, I'm going to help them. And one of them is a friend of mine named uh, Nobuhiro Nakamura. In fact, he actually took my wife and I on a distillery tour of the Yamazaki whiskey place. Uh, and he's helped me. We went to Midway together. We went to Pearl Harbor together. Uh, he's taken me to a lot of uh, veteran interviews. And so he's, he's happy that there's someone from you know, outside the country and that wants to present the history uh, in a neutral, factual, you know, because, you know, sometimes the Japanese try to tell their own stories. Fellow Japanese look at it as, oh, you're just trying to, you know, make a name for yourself or you're just, you know, uh, relaying right wing propaganda, blah, blah, blah. But I'm, I'm like, I have no dog in the fight. And I just want to tell your stories to my fellow Americans because we don't get to hear your stories. It's like finding that, that, that gold coin on the beach, you know, somewhere down in, you know, Cuba. You pick it up, you're going to flip it over. But for us Americans, the other side of the coin is almost blank. Yeah. So I'm trying to fill in that other side so we can, you know, learn more about what happened. And another side effect is that is that the more I've learned about the Japanese, the more I respect and appreciate Americans who fought in World War II. The soldiers, the Marines, the airmen, you know, the more I learn how tough the Japanese were and how dedicated they were, it makes me appreciate how t equally tough and more, um, I want to say more humane the Americans were because we were able to turn it off after the war ended and go into Japan peacefully. And so I have really a lot more respect and appreciation for any American who set foot on any island in the Pacific. They're, they're all heroes. Absolutely. Well, Dan King, thank you so much for joining us today on okay. History Happy Hour. And I want to remind our viewers that Dan is the author of several books. We've been talking today primarily about The Last Zero Fighter, but he also wrote a, a tune called Iwo Jima and the Yalu River Boys, which is about his uh, father's experiences in the Korean War. And uh, he's got, when we talk to Dan, it sounds like he's got a list of books that's going to keep him busy until he's as old as some of these uh, veterans are now. I've got, so. I've got this coming out now. I'm working on this. this is the book about the Oka, the rocket kamikazes. I don't know if you can see it or not, but this is signed by one of the Kamikaze Oka pilots. Wow. So I'm doing their story next, uh, how they were dropped well, from the bomber. So we'll have to bring you back for that one, Dan, but we're going to have to say goodbye for now. So thank you right. so, so much. Thank you. Okay. Dan King, which that was awesome, uh, Chris. And now it, it's time for um, – some history all around us, and I think you're starting us off. I am, yes. I have to see what you're showing. Well, I would show that. Oh, there we go. Uh, for those of you, um, we forgot to do this last week, uh, but you, if you tune in for the show about Lawrence of Arabia, uh, Duncan uh, Holland uh, sent us this picture of um, Lawrence's grave. Um, he died, uh, as you see, in 1935, kind of a tragic death. Um, but we thought it would be nice to know that there's a, there's a Lawrence Society and a lot of people like to go and pay their respects. So uh, that is Lawrence's great. And we also, we've been encouraging our viewers to share with us their history all around us. And um, so uh, Doreen uh, sent us some photos from uh, Tullahoma, Tennessee, which was the home of uh, Camp Forest in Tennessee. Chris, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, Camp Forest in Tennessee? Yeah, well, Camp Forest uh, was um, a wartime creation, and it becomes the center uh, of the Army Ground Forces maneuver area during World War II. Um, and basically what that means is some 850,000 uh, American servicemen train uh, uh, in Camp Forest in the 21 or 23 counties surrounding there before they get shipped to Europe. Uh, you might like to know as an aside that um, uh, Nashville was viewed as Cherbourg for all the Tennessee maneuvers, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, from, from Tullahoma. Also, there was a B-24 um, uh, training there. It was used to house POWs and Japanese, German, and Italian Americans who were interned. Uh, so it had a number of uses, and there's some other unit that I think may have trained there. I don't know who they are. We'll get to that, but I do want to just mention what Doreen said uh, in her, her email. Uh, she mentioned the World War II POW camp, and then when she grew up there in the 60s, the foundations of the barracks were still there. It's all pretty much all gone now. 
uh, and they could be seen from the access road. And she remembers her mother saying that the garden club was given permission to go onto the property and dig up the flower bulbs that the prisoners had planted around their barracks and were still blooming many years later, which is a wonderful kind of way of history living on. And yes, there was a certain, do you have your glass ready? A certain World War II deception unit, the Ghost Army, trained oh, no. at Forest in Tennessee. Yes, have a drink, everybody. And uh, the 23rd Headquarters Special Troops, otherwise known as the Ghost Army, trained there from January 1944 to um, May 1944. And that was really where the unit came together before they went off to Europe, Europe, they fought it. And so then <laughs> Europe, I think. And uh, well, we've been talking about the other oceans so much. I'm a little confused. But so we did get the ghost army into the show and give everybody a chance if they hadn't had one already to have a drink. And I would just like to add uh, uh, that next week we have another terrific guest coming on, very different uh, topic. Eric Schnitzer, author, historian, and interpreter at the Saratoga uh, National Battlefield. Uh, Saratoga Battlefield National Park, and he's going to join us next week. And the last thing, Chris, before we go, do you have a joke for us? I do, and it's particularly bad this week. Oh, how expected. <laughs> so uh, it's at the end of the war in Berlin. Planes are flying overhead. Bombs are falling. Uh, Hermann Goering and Adolf Hitler go to the top of the radio tower to kind of survey the battlefield around them. Um, and bombs are falling, and, and a very concerned Adolf Hitler turns to Goering and says, you know, um, Herman, I, I, I want to do something for the people who have endured so much. I, I want to do something that will bring a smile to their faces again. What is it that I can do? And Goering looks at Hitler and says, well, you could jump. <laughs> and that's bad, but I'll tell you how bad it is. How bad, is, how bad do you think that is? Um, it's bad enough that we just have to end the show right now. <laughs> As Yogi Berra famously said, it ain't over until they play the History Happy Hour theme song.